Hey, how's it going? It's George with Eden Church with you again in the unseen realm. Uh, this is pretty much like a part two, if you will, but this is called Jesus and the Transfiguration. Like I told y'all, if y'all have not seen Jesus and the Gates of Hell, go and watch that first. Just go ahead, stop this, go watch Jesus and the Gates of Hell first. Because really, these two go together, all right? And where we left off last time was talking about Genesis chapter 6, and we were getting the spiritual or the supernatural understanding that was in that passage, okay? And understanding that uh, up until um, the 400s, the uh, uh, fourth century, well, not 400s, but the fourth century, uh, uh, and, and, and that fell out of favor with uh, church fathers like, like Augustine, um, Man, Genesis 1 through 11 had a very supernatural understanding to it. Like people, they understood the context spiritually what was going on with Genesis uh, in chapters 1 through 11. But nonetheless, today we don't really have that understanding or that worldview of that. And so what I'm saying is that we've got to get that uh, understanding. We've got to have a supernatural worldview. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous that we're saying we believe in Christ, right? But he's not that supernatural. Like, you know, people talk about, I talk to people about, you know, you need to pray in tongues. Now, I've, I have many different uh, um, uh, uh, celebrations that I've uh, been seeing people who have been being baptized in the Holy Spirit and nobody's laying a hand on them, you know, so you can't say, well, you were sitting up there saying stuff in their ear, and they just started repeating after you, George. Nope. I was nowhere around. I'm getting random phone calls from random people. Not random people. I mean, I know who the people are, but I'm getting phone calls like, dude, so I just started speaking in tongues in the shower. It's like, dude, yeah, so do 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 Man, I say praise God to it. That's what I say, you know, but what, what ends up happening is they then begin to have an understanding that, man, God is doing something greater than just my effort and my might. He's supplying, he's supplying that. And so the thing is, is that we just got to keep preaching the truth. We just kind of keep telling people the truth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is giving gifts to men. Jesus is showering his, uh, uh, showering down the anointing that the Holy Spirit is falling on all men, and and young men are are are, are seeing vision. Old men are dreaming, and there's prophecy taking place and going forth. All these things are good. All these things are in the Lord, and and it makes it when we understand that man, this this Bible is a spiritual book written to spirit written to spiritual beings by a spirit being. Man, well, you know it's not really weird to think <laughs> that there's a that there's we have to have spiritual understanding when reading this book. That just makes sense. So. No further ado, we're going to jump right in. We're going to get into a uh, um, last, like well, I said last time we talked about Jesus in the gates of hell, understanding that Jesus took his disciples to the region where literally it was called the gates of hell. And so for him saying the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he's, he's telling them it's a double entendre. He said, hey, I'm bringing you to this place, but we're not here just for that. We're here for one more thing where I am taking back everything and reconciling it to myself. I'm wanting every I'm wanting everybody. I'm wanting you people to know and I'm wanting everybody in the spirit world to know that I am Lord. I control. I have authority and I'm taking everything back. So funny enough, we're going to start in Genesis to get that better understanding of that. All right. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and took wives any they chose. The Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man, for he is flesh, and yet his days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, 
These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So I sit there and like we, we just read the first four verses. And so we've been talking about this book of Enoch in that last uh, uh, episode. And we're talking about how second temple period Jews, pretty much a second temple period Jew is, is pretty much this. In the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, okay, pretty much everybody from that period until the time of Christ, Second Temple period Jews, <laughs> okay? So I just want you all to get an understanding. Second Temple period Jews had an understanding about those scriptures through the understanding they got through the book of Enoch. There are other Second Temple period writings that they also had common knowledge of and was a part of their, it was like they just understood it. I likened it to the example of, how my girls, they are all under the age, they weren't around when 9-11 happened, but they live in the context and understanding of 9-11. You see what I'm saying? So they don't understand the act that took place. They just understand that when you go to the airport, security lines are natural. Like, they don't understand that, no, you used to just be able to walk up to the gate, no problem. You see what I mean? Uh, people who are older than me or my age, they rem we all remember that. No, you can just walk up to a gate and just go do what you need to do and, you know, like wait on the person at the gate and then they go, hey, how's it going? You walk from the gate to the other places you need to go. No, nowadays they don't want to let you nowhere near it. You better stay back, you know. Uh, that's a common thing that everybody understands that because of this action, this is how things are. And everybody just kind of, you know, it's just an understanding everybody has. Okay? This book of Enoch was something that was one of those things. Everybody kind of had a knowledge and understanding, and that's, yeah, and they, they kind of agreed with it to the point that we read in First Peter, Second Peter, and Jude. Uh, we didn't even read in the one other parts where the, where the, where the souls were held, where, where the uh, spirits were held in Tartarus, until the judgment day of the Lord. We didn't even read those. There's so many other verses that could, you know, validate what I'm saying, all of which came out of here. Now, what I'm going to read is uh, in the book of Enoch, uh, we're going to read, uh, uh, it's uh, chapter 6, and we're going to read the first few verses of it, but just to kind of give you an understanding of where we're coming from. And it's going to lead into the day, Jesus, the transfiguration, okay? Uh if you want to get this, I keep looking at it and I keep going, oh, I forgot, I forgot. Okay, I'm sorry. You want a translation of the book of Enoch, you go find R.H. Charles. R.H. Charles. That'll give you a good translation of the book of Enoch. Because if you go try to Google the book of Enoch, you're liable to get some straight out wacky stuff. And I don't want you getting nothing wacky. I want you getting something solid, and that's actually, uh, this is a good scholar. He, he does good work, and he, he does, you know, fine translations. And so let it, you know, stick with that, you know, because we're talking about spiritual things and getting spiritual understanding. But what we're looking at is we don't want to be wacky. You know, you understand what I'm getting? I don't want wackiness. I want us to have... I want us to be fully persuaded that God is who he says he is. That Jesus really did die for our sins. That he died to set us free. That he died to restore us and He to restore us to who we were. Who we were was Adam before sin. Okay? But he's not only restored us to that, he has taken us much further because not only do we have the keys of the earth, but we got the keys of the kingdom of heaven also. Jesus said he'd give that to us. That's what he just said to Peter earlier. Nonetheless, here we go. Enoch, sixth chapter, starting about verse one. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and begat us children. <clears throat> and 
Semiaz, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone will have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they answered him and said, Let us swear an oath and bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. They swore uh, them all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And there all were two hundred who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. Now, wow. I mean, that this is just, I mean, wow. Okay, wow. That's all I can say is that there's so much stuff between the, the you know, Genesis 6, uh, even in the book of Enoch, giving an uh, understanding of what was happening there. Uh, but one of my favorite verses uh, in, in Scripture is actually Psalms 133. Psalms 133. And it says, how Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head that runs down the beard, even Aaron's beard, and the going down to the collar of his garments, as the dew of Hermon that descends upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I'm like, wow. Okay, so here it is. You have this understanding that uh, these uh, divine, I won't say divine, but I'm going to say these heavenly beings, about 200 of them, all descended on Mount Hermon, okay? And I'm going to show the uh, map of it. They all descended on that Mount Hermon. Isn't that interesting? They descended on Mount Hermon. They all agreed to basically... Uh, curse God, to go against God, and to, and to try to make their own children, okay? They, they agreed all that, to, to do all that, and they agreed and, and they took an oath together on Mount Hermon. Now, it's, it, it, what's interesting about that is think about this. Think about that took place in Genesis chapter 6, if you think about it. They made that pact. To, to to basically rail against God and to do their own thing in Genesis chapter 6, really, is what has given us that understanding of. That's when it took place. They came to Mount Hermon and did that. Is it not interesting that men in Genesis 11 decided to go against what God told them to do and come to one place and be in unity. These angels came together in unity, and then all of a sudden, these men of the earth came together in unity. And they said, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to do these things. And they could do those things because unity was present, and God commands the blessing in unity. Man, that's interesting. What's also interesting is this, that it was on Mount Hermon. It was on Mount Hermon that they came and they made that pact, which now gets us to the understanding of where we're at uh, here in Matthew 17. Now, Matthew 16, we just read about the, tra we just read about, you know, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood, didn't reveal this information to you that I'm the Christ, my Father revealed it to you. So in other words, you're now getting revelation from the Father. You're hearing the Father. This is good because that, that, that means I can move on and I can move forward. So we come here and we look in, Gen, uh, we look in uh, Matthew 17 and we're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read and this is about the transfiguration and I think this is very interesting. 
After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up to the high mountain alone and was transfigured before them. His face shone as the sun, and his garment became as white as a light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking to him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Um, if you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their face and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. As they came down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Well, now that's interesting. So we go through the transfiguration, and we and we we I, there are many people that are like, Well, why did the transfiguration have to happen? What was the transfiguration about? And once again, they tell stories about Peter, James, and John. They tell stories about, uh, they, they, you know, about this and about, they, they, they look at all the physical understandings. But I truly believe that the transfiguration happened because it was Jesus in the spiritual understanding of his mission here also that he was reclaiming what was his. See, you had these uh, the, uh, um, heavenly beings coming and making a pact and, and choosing to disobey God in this spot. Jesus comes back to that same spot and redeems it. He takes it back as his. And he says, I'll, be, I'll come here and I'll reveal who I am. And it's also great that, that here it is, you have Moses, the law, and you have Elijah representing the prophets, and you have Jesus, and he's like, you know what? I'm making a pact with my own people. Praise God. I'm making a pact. I'm making a covenant. I'm making an oath here, and I'm transfigured here. So in the very spot that you did evil, the very spot that you chose to go against God, in this very spot, I'm choosing to do exactly what my father has called me to do. Man, that's good stuff. Praise God. That That's what I'm saying is that Jesus went to certain places and did certain things on purpose. He went there to basically reclaim that spot, to reclaim this place that is meant to be a place of blessing because the because unity is there, because um, it's the dew that supplies Mount Zion, and I'm blessing this place, that I can take a place that was cursed because of what you did, and I can be put in that same place and it be blessed because of what I did, man. I thank you, Jesus, that you're the one that blesses. You're the one that lifts up. Man, that's good. See, when we understand that Jesus' mission was to redeem us, I mean, understand that that's what he's there for, but he's also there basically putting all the spiritual world on notice that, hey, I am God Almighty. I, I you know, am the one who owns all this. I know I said that wrong. I own all of this. But nonetheless, I own it all. It's all mine. It tells us in Isaiah 40, 22, it is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and inhabits in, in the inhabitants are as grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. You see, God doesn't need our tents. He doesn't need our thing. He doesn't need buildings. He doesn't need this to that so he can live in it. 
He's like, no, I made the universe. The universe is my inhabitation. That's why I live in, I live in everything and every being and every piece of uh, rock, plant, this and that. I'm God. I'm, I had to make something that fit me. And as it is right now, we still don't know how big the universe is. Bless God. Okay? But it's the one. It says in Isaiah 60, Six, uh, uh, verse one, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where then is the house that you could build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For my hand made all those things. Thus, all the things have come to be, says the Lord. Man, that's the word of the Lord. Oh, <laughs> See, when we understand uh, basically that God is uh, reclaiming all the stuff that the enemy had tried to defile, when we understand that Israel and this patch of land Israel has, uh, that's really not all of the patch of land that God claimed, when you understand that that's his, you then understand why there were some fights that had to take place. But the the thing that a lot of people also get mad about is they talk about that there's two different gods. There's like the God of the Old Testament and then there's God of the New Testament. And, and, and what I'm saying is, no, there's just one God, but you got to understand what's at stake. When you understand you have a spiritual world view that these divine beings came into the daughters of men, and they produced children. And those children, they call them the Nephilim. And Nephilim literally means fallen ones. But what's interesting is that there has never been a time when Nephilim were written that they didn't think giants. (laughs) Okay? And what's interesting about that is David uh, was actually chasing some of the last of the giants. His fight against Goliath was to be ending the giant race, the giant, the the race of giants, okay? And I say race of giants because they are different and distinct from humans, okay? Because they're quasi-divine beings, right? Their parent, father, angel, is an angel or some kind of spiritual being, and they're Mother is a, 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 a human. Now, let's think about this, okay? Even when you go back into Genesis, and it talks about that, uh, it says there that Noah had found favor in the sight of the Lord, for he was pure of heart. Now, what if I were to actually tell you that Noah found favor in the heart of God because he was pure of heart? Me, he was like one of, the, he was one of the only human, pure human-blooded people left. That's how much the angel blood, if you will, think about it, got spread throughout all mankind. Remember, I'm telling you story time now. This is what I'm telling to you right now. Okay, don't believe me if you don't want. That's fine. I go, but it helps make, it helps make a lot of things make a whole lot more sense. For example... Why God would annihilate whole groups of people. Okay? Well, if you realize that it's annihilating whole groups of people because there are people that have tainted blood, meaning they have angel blood in them. See, if Jesus died and there are people who had angel blood and he died for all mankind and he died to forgive sin, and that person comes up and says, well, I have, uh, you know, I, I'm one-tenth angel. I got one-tenth of a, a divine being's blood in me. What would have to happen then is that God would have to forgive that those angels for their sin. Why? Because Jesus died. You know, so unless you're going to just curse the person and they can never be saved, which God wasn't going to do that either, what had to happen is that these, these, basically their children, uh, the giants and, 
and their offspring and those offspring from the incursion that took place from the sons of God mating with the daughters of men, okay, God had to get rid of them. Now, it's just interesting that the, the, the uh, Hebrew children, after, the, after leaving Egypt, God, is it not interesting that all the giants, <laughs> that there were giants in the land, in the land that God had given them? Isn't that like the devil try to sit, on the, the, sit in the place that is rightfully yours? Don't let him do that. Don't let him sit in the place that's yours. Man, praise God. It's like, uh, so these, uh, these ideas where they were told, you need to go in and you need to utterly destroy these people. I'm talking about man, woman, and child. Some cases, man, women, child, goats, livestock, all that. Uh, it, you know, when they had to go do that, it wasn't that, that God was like, I just don't really like those people. He was like, no, I'm getting rid of the polluted blood that's left over from this incursion that took place over here in Genesis chapter 6. And so when the children of Israel, that's why it said, man, it all fits together. I know I, I said this to you all earlier when uh, I was talking about how uh, God talked, oh, <clears throat> God with us from that, from that episode, God with us. When God was like, I'm going to send this angel, and he's going to go before you, and he's going to clear out the land before you. God was like, yeah, I'm going to get rid of all that residual angel, uh, human, mixed blood. I'm going to get rid of all that. That's why the angel was going before them. So when they did not go into the land, it kind of ticked God off. I mean, yes, he did get upset about that. But the thing is, is that we're going to read here in Deuteronomy. This is one of these episodes. And, and once again, the spiritual understanding connotation of what's going on here. So Deuteronomy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. Sidebar, remember, Caesarea Philippi, <laughs> Bashan, this is where this is at, FYI, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to the battle of Diri, or Edri, sorry. Then the Lord said to me, do not fear him, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into your hands, and you will do to him as you did to Shion, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered Og, the king of Bashan, with all his people into our hands also, and we struck him down until there was no survivor remaining. And he took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them. Sixty cities, all the region of Argob and the kingdom of Og in Bashan. Moving on, we're going to look at Numbers uh, 13 real quick, and then we'll go on and explain. Numbers 13, verse 28. However, the people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are fortified and very great. And also, we saw the children of Anak there. Uh, just FYI, Anak is uh, a giant. The Amalekites uh, dwell in the land of Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the edge of the Jordan. See, what we're looking at here is we're getting an understanding that uh, there was a lot more spiritually going on than physically 
going on. That the physical was really also was dealing with the spiritual. <clears throat> when you look and it talks about the sons of Anak were there. Anak is one of those giants. Anak, uh, uh, when you talk about the king uh, Og, and, and, and it was one of the giants. When you talk about his people, they were ones of the giants. Once again, it says clearly in Scripture that when they came out in Exodus, they were going over, and when they spied out the land, they came back and said, yeah, but there's giants there. And I'm telling you where the giants came from. I'm telling you as a point of, you know, it, it, I can't say it's a point of fact because I wasn't there. What I can tell you is that the revelation and, that I've gotten accompanied with the knowledge that I have went and found out and kind of got more revelation on. So I've put the revelation comes from what God has told me. And then when I've done the research, what my head has told me, and I was able to come and I'm putting these things together and I'm saying, man, wow, this makes a lot of sense now why God would just have complete peoples wiped out. Because if he's wanting to purify the system, remember the reason he even came up with the children of Israel, the reason why he even gave them the laws of God was to keep a bloodline together so that the Son of God had a place to be. Not just so there'd be a virgin, but that though the bloodline would be pure. Hmm. I'm just telling you. This is one of those things where it's like, yeah, believe me or don't believe me. I, I honestly say, yeah, okay. But I'm just saying, when I'm talking to you and when I'm preaching the word to you and I'm getting understanding about certain things and I'm telling you those things, if you have an understanding of where my head is at, it is truly planted in the supernatural. And when you understand that when I say my head is planted in the supernatural, yet at the same time, I do my due diligence to get and read and find the best material and, and to get the word and do that study. It's not that my head is planted in la la land. You see what I'm saying? No, it's that I'm choosing to make a choice to say, man, God, you are a spirit and those who worship you must worship you in spirit and truth. And so what I'm wanting to do at Eden is I'm wanting us to worship God in spirit and truth. I'm wanting us to read God's word in spirit and in truth. I'm wanting us to love people in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus comes here at this transfiguration, and I believe that he is transfigured on Mount Hermon because he is reclaiming Mount Hermon. He is coming just like he did all the rest of it. It's mine. He reclaimed it. That, that from this incursion that took place sometime around Genesis 6, from that incursion of the angels who did not hold their dwelling place, but instead came and defiled themselves with the daughters of men, um, Jesus is like, yeah, I'm coming back. I'm claiming back all of this. It's all mine. I, I'm being transfigured with the law and the prophet. And, and, and then God the Father speaks out and says, now just listen to him. He's reclaimed everything. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to what he told you to do. And, and, that, and, and, and understand that the gates of hell, figurative and literally, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You are all smack dab in the region of the gates of hell. Caesarea Philippi, here, uh, the reason why it was that way is because why? The angels descended in this region and they defiled, and they defiled the earth because of their sin against God. And God immediately put them in chains and put them in darkness and, and is holding them. And we're also told that where do demons come from? That in the book of Enoch, it gives the understanding that those demons come from the departed spirits of the giants. Because God was like, look, the giants, are ne they're not spiritual. <laughs> He's like, y'all left this. They're not spiritual. They're not coming back up here, <laughs> you know. He's like, dude, they'll just remain in the earth, disembodied. They, the, 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 
there's so many just things that I was like, wow, that the more understanding, this is one of those things where you got to figure this out for yourself. You got to go and look and read and do research for yourself. Um, but I'm wanting you, I'm wanting to, I guess I wanted to have this said so that y'all understand where my head is coming from, what I'm thinking about when I preach certain things and when I look at certain things. This is why I have a different worldview uh, than most of the church is because I'm sitting there and I'm saying, man, this stuff God did, Jesus came on purpose with a plan. He executed that plan. That plan was... Uh, uh, for the redemption of mankind, to redeem mankind. And it's redeeming mankind to what mankind was supposed to be, the God of this earth. Oh, gosh, I know. I know. As soon as I say God, people are like, oh, just cringe. I don't, I don't. I go, but that's what you were. God himself told you in Genesis chapter 1, let's make man in our image and let's make him have dominion over tells us in Genesis, I'm not Genesis, Psalms 8, that, that he gave all the works into, of, of his hand into the hands of man. Mm. I'm telling you people, it's like, this is, this is really good news, but we have, we have to actively think about this good news, actively uh, uh, rest in the work that Christ has done. When we understand what Jesus did, has, has done, what Jesus is really like, he's, man, he's just brought the, all this forth. It, the work is finished in Christ. That all of this stuff I told you, God still is God over the spiritual and the physical. So those, uh, it, I, I, just, I just hope that y'all really, this is one of those things that you got to catch. I, I, I don't think I can reason you into it. I don't think, and I don't want to reason you into it. I want you just to catch it. I just threw something at you. Hopefully you catch it. If not, listen to it again. This is not going to be one of those, these last two <laughs> uh, deals in the unseen realm. You're not going to get the first time you listen to it. You kind of got to, you kind of got to see like, oh, okay. Because what will end up happening is that the word, God's word will start popping. And the more you read God's word, the more you get an understanding of this worldview. So, uh, man, I hope that y'all uh, truly do get revelation and understanding about this. Um, one of the things that I like to do before we go is I just want to bless you all. I'm going to bless you all with Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace and believing through the experience of your faith that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound and be overflowing, bubbling over with hope. I pray that into your life today. Please go visit us at edenok.tv. That's E-D-E-N-O-K.tv. Uh, there you can get uh, other resources from the Believer's Authority, and you can check out other sermons that we've done and other series uh, you can also uh, get to our podcast, uh, get connected through there uh, to our podcast, uh, and that way you can like you know just subscribe to it, and you can just it'll just automatically as soon as a new one comes, bam, there you go. There's another one. I would ask that you would also give while you're there at EdenOK.TV. I ask that you go into our online giving and uh, look at becoming a partner with us. Uh, Everything helps. We're looking for partners, uh, uh, whether you can be a dollar a day partner, whether you can be a hundred dollars a month partner, which would help us, uh, uh, or whether you can help us buy equipment that we need. I mean, hey, anything helps. And so we would really appreciate uh, you joining in with us to uh, preach the gospel and move the word of God forward. I have taught some very tough things here in this unseen realm. And 
Uh, by no means is it just something I would go and share with everybody in the respect of, well, let me go out and share this in order to talk to you about Jesus. No, when we, uh, I'm sharing this so you can have an understanding and better revelation and knowledge that when I'm speaking, you understand that there, I, I see a, a, the spirit and the physical world, they're, they're in concert with one another, and God is ruling both of them. Man, that's great news. God is ruling both of them. I want you all to have a great day. It's been fun. See you later.